The Tom Woods Show, episode 1731. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, social media is a pit of misinformation when it comes to the subject of guns. So what you need is my free ebook, Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About Guns. Smashes all the myths and a lot of fun to read. Pick it up at wrongaboutguns.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Glad to have Jason Jewell back on the show. Jason is chairman of the Department of Humanities at Faulkner University. He teaches a number of courses for us at libertyclassroom.com. And he is the author of an article forthcoming in the Journal of Markets and Morality. We'll have a pre-publication version of it available for you. And it has to do with this fellow, Russell Kirk. You may have heard that name. He was one of the key intellectuals in the conservative movement shortly after uh, World War II. And it has to do with his views on economics. And this is not a small matter. This actually matters for a number of reasons that that we'll get into. And it turns out that Kirk, the conservative, was actually, well, fairly libertarian in his economics. And, and as I say, this, this does matter for reasons you'll see. But uh, this will be a fun conversation with Jason. Welcome back, Jason. Tom, it's great to be with you. I'm glad we have a chance to review your article. Let me do probably what I should have you do, but I'm going to let you be lazy for a minute, and then you'll carry most of the rest of the conversation. I want to situate this article in such a way that people get why it matters. I think some people just think, according to the the usual dichotomy that is presented to us, that you have so-called liberals in the American sense and so-called conservatives. And conservatives like the free market and liberals are skeptical of the free market. But it's so much more complicated and interesting than that because people who are really, really conservative, really traditionalist conservatives, a lot of them have been skeptical of the free market for a variety of reasons. They, they, they think it... Um, well, we could come up with a lot of, I mean, they think it displaces people. Like, you know, if, if there's some town and, and the, 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 the meatpacking plant closes up and leaves, it leaves, the, it leaves wreckage in the town. So it dislocates people. It's revolutionary in various ways. It's, uh, it, it, has, it has no borders philosophically. And so it, it encourages people to think in ways that aren't in tune with national or local needs and concerns. And then also, of course, we have right now uh, developing over the past several years, a distinctly self-described nationalistic brand of American conservatism that does think that libertarians make a fetish of the free market, and of course we can't just have unfettered trade and so on and so forth. So it's not just obvious, not simply obvious that Russell Kirk would be friendly toward market economics. It's not by any means automatic. And in fact, as you show in the article, toward the beginning of his uh, public life, even he did have some some skepticism about it. So this is why this matters. If even Russell Kirk says the market is okay for the following reasons, then all right, we've got a pretty big um, person in our corner, let's say. So that was how I wanted to to start things off. Do you, you think that's a reasonably good way of situating this article? Yeah, I think it is. And as you say, there are various reasons why people who call themselves conservatives might show varying degrees of skepticism of the free market. But one of the things that really interested me in writing this was the fact that we have had this movement over the last few years among conservatives of almost going out of their way to be critical of the market and of uh, libertarians who uh, allegedly worship the market at the expense of everything else in society. So what I was thinking was that there was a real possibility that some of these so-called national conservatives or the people who are attempting to revive the anti-capitalist features of distributism would try to sort of conscript Kirk onto their side and and turn him into a, a voice that allegedly is supporting their agenda. And I wanted to make sure that people understood that by at least by the end of his career, Kirk was certainly not in that camp. Well, also, I think people might think this about Kirk because of his bickering with libertarians. He had pretty unkind things to say about libertarians. 
Yeah, the Chirping Sectories article that was yeah. published in Modern Age in the early 80s is one that frequently gets brought up. And uh, again, by the late 80s, he was saying some nice things about libertarians, but still seemed to view them as primarily disciples of John Stuart Mill and all the philosophical problems that go along with that. I know you've had some episodes dealing with, with uh, different problems in Mill, but when it comes to the, the market itself, uh, Kirk was much more friendly to that side of things. I'm pretty sure by the 90s, well, what year did he die? Was it 95? 94. 94, okay. I thought by the early 90s, I remember him reading somewhere that he did say some nice thing about libertarians with regard to foreign policy. He thought libertarians more or less got foreign policy right. So that's something. Yeah, that's correct. There are a couple of essays where he deals with libertarians directly. That Chirping Sectories article was the earlier one. And then in the late 80s, he delivered a speech at the Heritage Foundation that was later turned into an essay, a chapter in one of his books. And in that lecture, he does say two or three very positive things about libertarians. One was that they were on the right side on foreign policy, if not trying to be going out on messianic projects to take democracy to the world. So he was favorably juxtaposing libertarians with the neoconservatives there. And he also praised libertarians for having a greater appreciation of life on the human scale and not trying to be prone to gigantism and all that sort of thing like he saw as a tendency in, in a lot of the other uh, national greatness conservatives and that sort of thing. So he did have a few nice things to say about libertarians before coming back in that lecture to critiquing what he saw as their philosophical shortcomings. Right, right, right. And and that is a topic that I've covered, I'm pretty sure, with Brad Berzer, who's the great biographer of Russell Kirk, who is himself, I would say, let's say a conservative-leaning libertarian. Right. So, and 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 Brad very much wants to highlight the libertarian sympathetic aspects of Kirk because he thinks that Kirk by and large has been mischaracterized partly because of the tone of the way he's addressed libertarians. But what matters more is um, are your actions and what you do and what you believe than how you, know, how you speak to people. And when you actually look at what he's really calling for, you know, a, a decent amount of it is libertarian. So let's let's run through this this piece. I had an article in the Journal of Markets and Morality years ago, and I don't remember what the heck it was about. I, I'm sure it was fantastic and <laughs> wonderful and groundbreaking, but I know I've been in this journal. I just don't remember what the heck I wrote. I, got, I don't even know where, my, now that everything's online, I used to have a CV where I, I kept line by line every single publication that I had in every print outlet there was. And now I just don't write for print outlets anymore. And so I just stopped keeping track. I don't even know how many articles I have or whatever. So, Anyway, it doesn't matter. You are, however, continuing to, to publish and putting me to shame here. You've got a section, The Importance of Economics, Work and Prosperity. So in the early 80s, Kirk wrote Economics, colon, Work and Prosperity, and a, a book. And it's I know about this book because people have summarized it for me, but I've never read it either. What, what's the, what was the purpose behind it? In the early 80s, Kirk was working for an organization called the Educational Research Council of America. It was an outfit in Cleveland. It was a nonprofit that designed and published curricula for high schools. And the ERCA's publications were, were used around the country. So Kirk was in a situation where for five or six years, he would fly over to Cleveland, spend three or four nights there every week, and then fly back to Michigan. And one of the main projects that he worked on while he was employed by ERCA was this textbook that was intended for use in high schools. So Economics, Work, and Prosperity was the title of that book. And Kirk finished the manuscript around 1982 or early 1983. And then the organization was piloting the textbook in some schools in the Cleveland area. And at the Russell Kirk Center in Macosta, Michigan, where I did the research for this article, they have all these boxes of papers of feedback from the teachers who were piloting this book. And so they were making progress towards getting a final draft of it and, and publishing it. And then the organization, uh, ERCA, had to close its doors. They ran out of money. 
So in 1985, they shut down without having published Kirk's book. So Kirk shopped it around for another few years and finally found a publisher for it. And that was ultimately Abeka Books, which is down in Florida. And it publishes primarily textbooks for uh, Christian homeschoolers. Schools, I thought. Homeschools. Yeah, that's yeah right. I get their catalogs. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, Abeka still publishes that book. It's still in print. It's in a third edition now. Of course, the re- revisions that it were made after Kirk's death, some of them wound up being pretty significant. In some ways, it's understandable why they would want to revise the book because when Kirk wrote it in the early 80s, a lot of his references were sort of in the context of the Cold War and some of them were dated. So they've, they've revised it a couple of times, but the recent edition of it is missing some of the, what I think are some of the significant passages that shed real light on Kirk's understanding of economics. So when I was working on this book, I made sure I was using the first edition. So I was getting it straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Smart. Okay. So what kinds of things does he say in here? I mean, I I guess he takes a basically free market line. He's not an anarchist. So he thinks that the government needs to establish the framework within which the market can operate. But is, it, is this just going to be boilerplate Republican Party talking points? Or is, it, is it deeper than that? What do we find in there? It's pretty interesting in that, for one thing, it, it doesn't read like a typical economics textbook. I mean, you can definitely tell that a professional economist did not write this. Um, and for some people, that might be seen as a drawback. But no, Not necessarily. <laughs> not in this day and age. <laughs> but it, it's missing a lot of the graphs and charts that you would expect to find in a typical introductory text. So Kirk is much more inclined, in a way, to the Austrian method of verbal reasoning and trying to, so to speak, talk out the argument rather than try to depict it graphically. Uh, but also, because of Kirk's own background and his immersion in the you know the western tradition of literature and history and all that you get a lot of really interesting passages where he cites snippets of poems and novels and all kinds of other things that most economists wouldn't have ever made a connection to or ever thought to include in a work like that so it's almost like you're getting a a more humanistic so to speak uh, education in economics as you read it and it's also not laid out in quite the same way that a, a typical economics textbook would be i mean he doesn't start off like Adam Smith with the division of labor or a discussion of the reality of scarcity or anything like that. He starts off with a discussion of, of human nature and proceeds in a way that you might not think is, is quite as obvious if you're familiar with your typical economic textbook. That, that's one of the things, by the way, Tom, that convinced me that Kirk was in fact the author of this book. Uh, I talked to several scholars while I was working on this article who said, oh yeah, I've heard of that book. But I never read it. I just assumed that Kirk didn't really write it, that it was ghostwritten. Uh, by oh. Somebody else. And so I think that's one reason why a lot of people have ignored this book. But it's pretty clear if you take the time to read it that it is, it's in Kirk's voice for sure. And I, I think that that's one reason why I thought it was significant to try to bring it to the attention of people who are, who are interested in, in free markets and interested in the history of conservative thought. But at any rate... He covers a lot of ground in this book on the typical things like the importance of exchange and uh, savings in the economy. And he talks about where does money come from and and its function in the economy. So it's a lot of those technical kinds of concepts that you would expect to find in a typical economics textbook, but it's not presented in a partisan way uh, in any sense. So he didn't write it as... I mean, obviously, he was expecting this to be used in schools around the country, and so he wasn't trying to bring in a lot of ideological discussion. What interested me about it, for one thing, was that it showed that he really did understand economic phenomena to a much greater extent than I think a lot of libertarians and professional economists have given him credit for. But then also, he points out a lot of the obvious shortcomings of interventions in the marketplace, much more so than I think, um, for example, a Keynesian author would. Well, I'm surprised that you even see him offering at least a practical objection to antitrust law, because I would expect that would be one of the areas where a traditionalist might say, we have to rein in concentrations of wealth and, and and economic power, and he's skeptical about whether that's really doable. Yeah, if you know about Kirk's affinity for the 
English legal tradition and common law and all that sort of thing, prohibitions on monopolies go all the way back in English history to before the Norman Conquest, so more than a thousand years of tradition there. And you would expect a writer like Kirk to say, well, obviously, we've always recognized the need for legal prohibitions on monopoly, but that's not where he goes in the section on monopoly in this book. He says, yeah, you can have antitrust law, but uh, antitrust law is not always effective. And uh, in reality, if you have real unhampered market forces operating, then it's almost impossible for a monopoly to form in the first place. So that sounds like a the same kind of line of reasoning that you would see in a textbook that was written by an Austrian economist. So uh, that was one of the things that really jumped out at me as I read through his discussion of um, the government's role in the economy. Let's say something about trade, because that's an area where there's a, a whole wing of conservatism and, and left liberalism, uh, certainly until he had to change his view a little bit for public consumption, even Bernie Sanders uh, agreed. Uh, this is an area where there's call for government intervention to uh, you know, level the playing field and all the other stuff. So that would be another area where I would expect to see Kirk favoring some kind of government intervention. What's the real evolution of his thought on that? Yeah, this is one of these areas where I, mean, I, I think I would really be misrepresenting Kirk if I said that he was a free trader, you know, even near the end of his career after he had read pretty deeply into the economic literature. But I did detect a progression in his thinking over time, whereas if you look at his early works when he first got on the map in the early 50s with books like The Conservative Mind, he seemed almost hostile to the idea of trade, that that trade was something that you should have suspicion of and it, it undermined society in a way that would cause it to lose its conservative character. He, in, in the conservative mind, he has some not very nice things to say about the people in parliament in the 19th century who were advocating free trade in Britain, for example. But then by the time we get to this textbook in the 1980s, Kirk really seems to understand the insights of the classical economists about the, the gains that can be made from trade and how it really does increase the prosperity of the ordinary person and how it's desirable to that extent. Uh, he still does want to apparently leave some room on the margin to have some regulation of trade if, if there are things like, um, you know, like the Adam Smith idea of national defense as being one of the areas where we might not want to have completely free trade for national security reasons. But Kirk, in this book, Economics, Work, and Prosperity, pretty clearly lays out why the division of labor is important and why it's even significant to extend that across international boundaries. He shows a, a very good understanding of comparative advantage. And so whatever you want to say about Kirk's stance on trade, I don't think you could really accuse him of not understanding the benefits that come from trade. It's just that he thinks that there might be a handful of things that might trump that consideration in the uh, modern economy. Yeah, and by the way, that's the kind of thing that I've tried to get libertarians to understand. It's because libertarians will say, but look, it's obvious, just, just work it out on paper. If you have free trade, it's going to benefit the world overall. There's going to be more wealth created. And I understand that, and the, uh, some of these traditionalists understand it, but what they're saying is, I don't care that the overall number of widgets all over the world is increased. I care about my country. Okay, maybe if I institute protectionist policies, the rest of the world will, maybe there will be less wealth created, but my country will be relatively better off. That's where you have to address them and say, no, you're actually, you're going to be hurting your country too. That's where you have to get at them. Right. And even in a situation where you might say that free trade increases the overall wealth within your country, there still might be particular geographical regions in your country, for example, that might be devastated economically as a result of foreign competition. So that's the sort of thing where Kirk would say that a conservative is interested in making sure you try to balance the interests of different groups in the society. And if, you know, opening up the floodgates of foreign competition is going to devastate Appalachia, just to take one example, then prudence might dictate that you want to maintain some, uh, some protection there 
uh, because you don't want that region to be devastated. So yeah, you might sacrifice some overall economic gains in the interests of uh, protecting that region uh, of the country. In terms of the environment, he takes what seems to be a nuanced view, but with, in general, you're left with the impression that probably the wealthy societies that are you know, made possible by market economies are best equipped to handle these challenges. Right. And this is one of uh, what I thought was a really interesting area because even while I was at the Kirk Center doing this research, there were, um, I, I met one other scholar there who was sort of playing with the idea that maybe Russell Kirk would have been favorable to the idea uh, of a carbon tax to mitigate climate change because of his concern for conservation and, and all this sort of thing. And coming fresh off of reading this textbook and, and the various sections in there that dealt with the environment, I was a little more skeptical of that position because Kirk very clearly says that, yeah, private pollution is a problem, but if you turn things over to the state, the state can cause even more environmental degradation. And so he gives the example that uh, in the 1980s was still not all that well known, I don't think, of the kind of environmental devastation that was going on in socialist countries in Eastern Europe and and in the Soviet Union. And uh, he also gives the example of the, the American military causing all kinds of very significant pollution of the Great Lakes. And so he says that we can't just have a command and control kind of environmental regime. Uh, we need to understand that uh, wealthy people value a cleaner environment and they're in a position to demand that economically more so than people who are impoverished. So yeah, we want to have economic growth so that um, we can have cleanliness in the environment as well. Hey folks, let's take just a quick minute to thank a sponsor I am so proud to have, and that is Better Help. It's not self-help, it's professional counseling. I venture to suggest that there is not a person among us who could not stand to benefit from time to time from professional counseling. And by the way, I've used Better Help myself at a time when I just needed a neutral third party to talk to, to talk through some things and get some perspective that I didn't think my friends could give me because, of course, they're going to tell me what they think I want them to say. BetterHelp assesses your needs, matches you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating in under 24 hours in a safe and private online environment. Send a message to your counselor anytime. You get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions, all without ever having to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room. You can find licensed professional counselors at BetterHelp who are specialized in depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, sleeping, trauma, grief, family conflicts, and more. The testimonials are out of this world, and in fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash woods. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash woods. All right, let's talk now about um, resources. You you mentioned Julian Simon, and I did an episode on the, the bet that Julian Simon had with Paul Ehrlich. So maybe we can start with that. But you could imagine, again, if you've dealt with any people who are truly, really traditionalist conservatives, some of them thinking that libertarians are just always have a Pollyanna outlook. You know, that if I jump off a cliff, I'm not worried because, you know, some entrepreneur will invent a, uh, you know, in midair parachute company to save me before I hit the ground. You know, there's that kind of attitude that they have toward us, that we're, we're always assuming that there's a rosy outcome if we just leave people to their own devices. And given the, you know, the sort of ridicule to which Kirk uh, subjected libertarians, it's not implausible to have expected that. So l- let's talk about what his actual views in this were, but start off with that Simon Ehrlich bet, because that's really important. Yeah, this was one of the most interesting things about doing the research for this article is that I, I think pretty conclusively demonstrated that Julian Simon did have a significant influence on the way Kirk was thinking about resources and about population in the 1980s. And that bet that Simon had with Ehrlich goes back to the early 80s in which uh, Paul Ehrlich, who was the author of the population bomb and other 
sort of uh, doom and gloom works in the 60s and 70s was going around telling everybody that uh, we were going to have overpopulation and there was going to be mass starvation and we weren't going to have any way to have the resources necessary to sustain the world's population and so on. And Simon made a bet with Ehrlich in the early 80s to say, um, you know, pick any basket of 10 commodities that you want, and I'll bet you that 10 years from now, the prices of those commodities will be lower than they are today. And if Ehrlich was right, then that shouldn't have happened, obviously. There should have been a, you know, increasing scarcity of these resources, and the prices should have gone up. And so Ehrlich took the bet, and uh, it was very well publicized. It, was, it got attention in the scholarly literature and also in the popular literature. And uh, 10 years later, lo and behold, the prices of those commodities had declined. And so uh, Simon won the bet, and he said that this was um, confirmation of the thesis that he had advanced in a book that he published in the early 1980s called The Ultimate Resource, in which he said that human ingenuity is going to be able to solve a lot of these resource problems that we have a lot of this doom and gloom rhetoric about, because the, in his view, the ultimate resource is the human mind. And human beings are always looking for substitute uses for various resources, or if we're running out of one thing, we maybe can find something else that can become a substitute for it, or we're accumulating capital that gives us more efficient ways of reaching the resources that are in the ground, or, or what have you. So he extended this analysis all the way back to the ancient world and said, look, over the last several thousand years, the prices of resources have been gradually dropping. And so we, we don't have any reason to think that that's not going to continue into the future. And our, our descendants will probably be more resource rich in a certain way, even uh, more so than we are today. Even though, yeah, maybe there is a finite amount of resources in the earth, but we are nowhere near the, the peak resource use, so to speak, and our descendants will be able to have those in greater relative abundance than we do. So this book, The Ultimate Resource, was published around 1981. I'm forgetting the exact date, but it's pretty clear that Kirk relied on it when he was writing Economics, Work, and Prosperity. All right, so there's the, the background for this. I, I personally find that Ehrlich and Simon bet fascinating and just such a great example of uh, you know, how we beat the doom and gloomers. But let's talk some more about Kirk here in this context and where he comes down on this. All right, so Kirk, near the end of the book, uh, Economics, Work, and Prosperity, lays out a number of alleged problems that various people have advanced to say, we've got all kinds of economic uh, distress ahead of us and we're going to you know, wind up in deep depression and so forth. And Kirk takes an opposite position to that. He titles his final chapter, An Optimistic View. And one of the things that he, well, I say one, several of the sort of doom and gloom predictions that he rehearses in that chapter, such as overpopulation or running out of resources. Um, he says, there's no reason for us to fear these doom and gloom outcomes. Sound economics tells us that we can overcome these problems if we allow markets to operate in a relatively unhampered way. And I, I think a good example of this is on the question of population, whereas people like Paul Ehrlich had said that the increasing population of the world was going to mean mass starvation and running out of resources and all that, Kirk uh, pretty much rehearses the Julian Simon response to that line of criticism and says that, no, we can be confident that we'll have greater amounts of electricity and other kinds of things that modern civilization relies on well into the future, even though we have an increasing population. And one reason why I thought this was so interesting was that if you go back to Kirk's writings from 30 years earlier, you do see more of a pessimistic uh, view of population and other kinds of concerns like that that you would have seen in some of the writings of people like Wilhelm Rutke. Uh, who was himself a free market economist, but seemed to be pretty pessimistic about uh, the future of uh, resource usage and that sort of thing in society. So 
when Kurt comes along in the 80s and basically repeats the Julian Simon line, uh, when I first read Kirk's book, I thought, man, this sounds like he's, he's talking, he's taking this straight out of Julian Simon. And sure enough, when I went up to Macosta and looked in Kirk's library, there was uh, the ultimate resource in, his li- in, in the list of books that he had in his library at the time of his death. Oh. And uh, when I dug out the old first edition of the teacher's guide to this book that uh, his widow Annette Kirk provided to me from the archive, he does uh, list Julian Simon uh, specifically in the teacher's resources for that chapter and says Simon is the guy to go to here. Okay, so, so we don't have to speculate at all. We know for a fact. Yeah, but, but, but I had never seen any reference to that in any of the literature on Kirk. As far as I know, wow. I'm the first person to ever call attention to that. Yeah, so. <laughs> that's what I like to hear. I like those words. That is fantastic. That's great. Now, this article will be coming out in the Journal of Markets and Morality, but if you're a Tom Wood Show listener, you, get, you can get and read it secretly. Okay, just don't tell anybody. Right? Just don't let this get out. We've got a link for you at tomwoods.com slash 1730, 1730. Okay, shh. We don't want the Journal of Markets and Morality people to get wind of this. Okay, maybe I'm exaggerating the extent to which I'm being a, a, a revolutionary here, but nevertheless, it's a pre-publication version is available for those of you interested over on the show notes page. And of course, if you like Jason Jewell, and all decent people do, he teaches a bunch of courses for us over at libertyclassroom.com, which is where all the smart libertarians hang out and learn things. So go do that, libertyclassroom.com. Get a coupon at libertyclassroom.com slash coupons. And Jason, thank you for doing this and for talking to us today. Thanks a lot, Tom. It's always a pleasure. All right, folks, quick announcement for you. Brand new podcast hosted by a Tom Wood Show listener called Freedom Adventure. You can find it at yourfreedomadventure.com. And it covers the kinds of topics that we need covered in this day and age. So plenty of stuff on the lockdowns and whether they work stuff on climate science. They have an episode on what is the cause of this coin shortage and how come you can't get change at the store. I know this hasn't hit all parts of the country, but certainly where I am, I have stores begging me to use exact change or not expect coins from them and stuff like that. So all these kinds of topics are covered on Freedom Adventure. So give that a try. Give a fellow Tom Wood Show listener a shot over at Your Freedom Adventure. Dot com. And of course, I'll link to that at tomwoods.com slash 1731. And yet again, we have a Tom Woods Show listener who got his hosting through my link. So gets a shout out from me, a membership in my bloggers group, where it's not just for bloggers, it's for anybody who used that link. And we all help each other out in there and answer questions and stuff. And some tutorials and, and just all good stuff for free. All you gotta do is just use my link to get your hosting. So tomwoods.com slash publicity, it will give you the details for that. And I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free. And we'll see you next time. Like the sound of the Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.